This is my daughter, Sonia. She is 16 months old, and she is very clever. Uh, here she is emptying DVDs out of the drawer uh, in, uh, in our house. And actually, here she is helping me install a baby gate in the kitchen. Um, she was actually a little disappointed when she found out what that gate was for. <laughs> but uh, despite being clever, she, uh, she's actually quite young. And as a result, she has very little prior knowledge of the world. And so when she encounters new objects, it's always interesting to see how she figures out what they're for. Um, and so when she was just a couple months old, we introduced her to the typical sort of tasteless baby mush diet. Uh, here she is nibbling on a spoonful of the stuff. And after not too long, she decided that it was time for her to take matters into her own hands. She was going to feed herself. And so we dug up a spoon for her to use, something more appropriate for her to learn with, uh, and gave it to her. And without any explanation, any demonstration, she took the spoon and she started trying to use it as a spoon. It was, it was clear that she knew what it was for. Um, and since then, she's discovered the cutlery drawer and is pulling out sh uh, spoons and forks of all different shapes and sizes and colors, um, seemingly always knowing what they're actually for. Um, and this all happened well before she had the communication skills that would have allowed us to explain to her the concept of eating and cutlery and so forth. And her capacity, seemingly innate capacity, to recognize that similar objects are used for similar purposes uh, suggests to me that, in, that there's this built-in rule in our minds, uh, very fundamental, that the structure of an object tells us a lot about its function. And this is true not only of man-made objects like spoons, it's also true if you look at nature. Uh, wings generally are used for flying, legs for walking, and so forth. Um, and this, this sounds like a ridiculously simple observation, and it is. But this simple rule can reveal truly remarkable things when we apply it to complex living systems, complex parts of the world. Um, and in, in particular, in my work, I'm interested in understanding and uh, predicting the way that complex living systems uh, behave, from cells to societies. And what we're finding is that structure, the structure of a cell, the structure of a civilization, the structure of a society, can actually allow us to make some very strong predictions about the way that those systems are going to behave. And so today I want to give you some insight into how this is possible, how we can just use the structure in order to actually learn about the system itself. But before I jump into this, uh, let me address up front a criticism that I've heard of this kind of work, and that is why would we want to predict the, these systems in the first place? And it turns out that being able to predict uh, the behavior of cells or economies or societies has very tangible benefits for all of us in the form of health, uh, social stability, prosperity, and even more esoteric things like happiness. Um, and I think one of the best ways to get an appreciation for the value of prediction is to look at some situations in which our predictive abilities have failed us. Uh, and so if you look at, for instance, the financial downturn, uh, our inability to foresee it effectively kept us from taking steps to avoid it or to mitigate the damage that it would do. If you look at biology, our inability to predict the way that cancer cells respond to drugs keeps us from designing better and more effective treatments more quickly. And sort of in a more general sense, if you consider that most of the, uh, one, many of the greatest challenges that we face as this human civilization, war, poverty, education, nutrition, even climate change, all of these have significant social components. And as a result, the solutions will have significant social dimensions as well. Certainly, science and technology are going to help, but in the end, we're going to have to build better, more stable, sustainable societies. And so in all of these cases, whether we're considering biology or economics or so sociology, the, um, the, the, uh, the ability to actually make these predictions, to have some idea about the hy a hy a hy a hypothesis about the world, effectively allows us to choose actions that uh, reach the outcomes that we want. Now, many of you may be wondering, why use structure? I mean, my opening example was my daughter. That's, uh, she's 16 months old. We're not children. We know a lot about the world. Why aren't we using additional information in order to actually make these predictions? And it's true, we're not children. But when it comes to complex living systems, our knowledge is staggeringly incomplete. If you consider that of the 20,000 plus genes in the human genome, we know what virtually none of them do. We know very little about them. And despite having thousands of years of human civilization behind us, we know uh, precious little about how societies and economies form, behave, and fail. And so 
the upshot of this is that we are more like my daughter puzzling over her spoons and forks than we might like to think. And the question is, how can we use our limited knowledge to make good guesses about the way the world is going to behave? Now, of all the possible information we might be able to obtain about a living system, often it's composition, the parts it's made of, and the structure, the way those parts are connected, are the easiest to obtain. And so we actually know a lot about the structure of complex systems. So any investment we can make in actually being able to use structure to predict the behavior of these systems is going to yield immediate benefits. And immediate payoffs is exactly something that's needed in the area of cancer research, for example. Um, by some estimates, one in three people are going to develop and have to deal with cancer in their lifetime. And I personally have already come across it twice. And I'm here by virtue of what doctors already know about cancer detection and treatment. And, but many people are not so fortunate, and so we certainly need to develop better and more efficient treatments. Now, one of the major obstacles to, the designing, to designing more effective drugs is simply evaluating drug candidates themselves. And in order to, to determine the effect of a drug candidate, it's necessary to take that drug into a lab, grow a culture of cancer cells, expose them to the compound, harvest those cells, analyze them in the laboratory, and this process from, from beginning to end to reach conclusive results can take from months to, to a year. And so evaluating a large panel of drugs can take a long, long time. And this is where predictive analysis enters. If we could actually predict the way that cancer cells would respond to a drug, we could quickly evaluate uh, a large panel of possible compounds and narrow down, uh, narrow down to just a small number that we would take into the lab. We could evaluate hundreds using the computer and identify a handful of promising candidates that we could then use this exhaustive technique on. And in my lab, this is one of the topics and projects that we've, we've worked on. Uh, we've developed a method that can predict the, the response of specific types of melanoma and breast cancer cells to a variety of cancer, uh, cancer drugs. Uh, and we use, do this only using structure. Now when I say structure, this is what I'm talking about. This is a, a biochemical network in a cell. Um, the ellipses are proteins, the, the arrows are interactions between those proteins, and it's networks of interaction like this that produce a cell's behavior. Now, it, and so if we modify these proteins or these interactions, we can actually modify a cell's behavior. And this is exactly what we want to do in the case of cancer, modify the biochemical networks in such a way that the cancer cell dies. Now, this diagram is leaving out a lot of details, some of which we know, most of which we don't. For instance, proteins have size, weight, shape. Interactions happen at different speeds, with different frequencies, uh, with, uh, in different parts of the cell. Um, and none of these details are actually shown in this diagram. But it turns out that we actually don't need to know these details in order to predict the way that this network is going to respond to a variety of cancer compounds. Um, by looking at just the way that the, the drugs will uh, modify the structure of this network, we can actually make a prediction about the, way and, uh, about the way that network will act in the cell itself. One of my favorite stories about this method happened not long after we developed it. My collaborator, a cancer researcher, had been trying to find a, a combination of compounds that would decrease the amount of AKT, a protein in this in this network uh, in a cancer cell that he'd been looking at. And so we took all the different compounds that he had in his lab and we ran our method on all the different combinations that we could come up with. Uh, and there were several hundred of these combinations. And, uh, we, uh, we, and this was all done computationally, so it only took uh, you know, 15 minutes or so to actually run all of this analysis. And we took the 10 that, produced the, uh, that, that were predicted to produce results most similar to what he wanted to see in the lab. And so he took these 10 into the laboratory and he started working through them and the second one worked. It actually did what he wanted it to do. And to me, this is a success story for this kind of structural analysis. Taking very limited knowledge about the system itself, but making strong predictions that allow us to quickly prune down the set of possibilities we have to consider and focus on the things that are the most promising. And so we can use structure to predict the way that these behave. Now I want to talk about a, a very different kind of complex system, and that is human civilization. Um, and the question is, can we use the same idea that structure, uh, that, that structure actually can be used to learn about human behavior? And to, to, to work our way into this, I want to start by convincing you that human behavior is even encoded in the structures that we find in human civilization and society. And to do this, I want to talk about the ancient Roman Empire. 
When I was a graduate student, I would meet with a colleague and, and mentor of mine, a uh, professor of ancient Mediterranean civilization, and we would get together for lunch and have all sorts of harebrained research ideas that were way more science fiction than, than anything you could actually do. But uh, during one conversation, he mentioned that he had been invited to give a talk at a conference on roads and antiquity. Um, and I mentioned in the course of the conversation that I was actually very interested in roads because I'd been wondering whether it was possible to figure out how a society worked by just looking at its road system. And so he was intrigued by this idea, and the following research project was born. So this is a map, uh, a road map, of the, the ancient Roman Empire. And for me, roads have always been particularly sort of profound man-made structures in the sense that in antiquity, these roads were effectively the major mechanism by which information, ideas, resources, and people moved around an empire. And so if we were to find human behavior encoded in a social structure, I believe that we would find it here. And in particular, our question was, by analyzing just this road system, could we actually identify functional units that actually operated in the Roman Empire? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. So we wrote a program that went through and actually identified clusters of towns, communities, that were more closely connected to one another than to the rest of the empire. And this is what we came out with. And what's remarkable is not only that these correspond to entities that actually existed within the Roman Empire over 2,000 years ago, but that they correspond to different kinds of communities. Some of them are political boundaries. They seem to follow the provincial and diocesanal uh, boundaries that were used as part of the political administration of the Roman Empire. Others are definitely reflecting economic relationships that existed. Others still actually encode empires that predated the Roman Empire, that were uh, at some point absorbed into the Roman Empire during its expansion. And finally, others seem to correspond to regions that actually have similar linguistic or cultural heritage. And to me, these are the regions that are the most fascinating because they suggest that, ro that the road structure tells us not only about political and economic entities, which presumably could have influenced road, road construction, but that road structure also encodes more purely social phenomena like culture and language. And all of this was done simply looking at the road structure itself, using no other knowledge, no prior knowledge about the Roman Empire. Now the question is, how can we use these sorts of ideas to learn about modern society? I mean, we could look at roads, but in an age of email and air travel and phone calls, information and roads are no longer the major mechanism by which information and resources move. And so I suspect that if we looked at that, we wouldn't find what we were looking for. Instead, I want to look at social networks, the, the, the interconnected web of relationships that we maintain across a wide array of media, be it phone conversations or Facebook or face-to-face -face interactions. Now, for those of you who are users of Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or any other social, uh, social networking platform, I would like to thank you for making this next bit of research possible. Because until we started throwing our information online, mapping social networks was virtually impossible. However, using data from these social networking platforms, from cell phone logs, uh, from emails, and other digital forms of communication, we can reconstruct many of the relationships that we maintain with family, with friends, with colleagues and coworkers, even casual acquaintances. Now, of course, it's not quite that easy. Relationships are actually very complex. And while it's easy to tell whether two people have a relationship, it's very hard to tell what kind of relationship that is. It's very difficult to get the details, what kind of relationship it is, how old it is, how strong that relationship is. And so once again, we're in a situation where we know a lot about the structure, but we know very little about the details. But as it turns out, we can say a lot using just the structure of social networks. Now, I want, in the next few minutes, I want to talk about, what, uh, about how we can use structure, social structure, to learn about how people form relationships. And to do this, we're going to look for these, triangles. Now, what do triangles have to do with how people form relationships? Well, it turns out, a lot. So imagine the following situation. Uh, Saturday night, you're throwing a party, and you've invited all your friends, uh, and we're friends, so you've invited me as well. And everybody shows up, and we're all mingling and having a good time. And at some point in the evening, I strike up a conversation with someone 
attending the party that I have not met yet. Now, I want to freeze this moment and think about it for a moment because the social network is about to change. Before the party, this is how the social network looked. Zoomed in on you, this new friend of mine, and, and me. The reason that I am at the party, the reason this person that I'm meeting is at the party, the reason we're having this conversation ultimately is because we share a mutual friend, which is you. Now let's step forward in time after this conversation. The social network has changed and a triangle is formed. The triangle is formed because of that mutual relationship that we shared. And this is called triadic closure, and it's one of the major mechanisms by which relationships form in social networks. But what's important is that all of these different mechanisms by which relationships form have different structural signatures in the social network themselves. Which means that, for example, meeting through a mutual friend, by and large, triangles are formed only by meeting through mutual friends. Now, with a bit of math, we can actually count up the number of triangles that we see in a network and turn that into a very strong estimate on, in terms of how much uh, of these different mechanisms are happening. How often are people meeting through mutual friends? Now, why is this important? Well, consider that Facebook actually has many more triangles in its social network than Twitter. This means that people are forming relationships differently depending upon the platform that they're actually using. In Facebook, people are forming more friends, friendships through mutual uh, through a mutual, a mutual friend than in Twitter. And I suspect that this has something to do with Facebook support for groups, which are effectively the online equivalent of parties and gatherings. And we did this all through just looking at structure. We didn't have to survey people. We didn't have to do complex analysis of text. All we had to do was look at the structure, and it's that simple. Now, in closing, I want to take a step back and sort of take a broader look at some of these ideas that I've presented. I've given you a couple examples of where structure tells us a lot about function. But have I just selected very convenient, specialized examples? Or is structure really a reliable indicator and source of information about function? And I would argue the latter. Structure tells us about function because objects perform their function through their structure. A spoon lifts food via its shape. A cell in a cell, a protein, per performs its function through interaction with other compounds and other proteins. In civilization, information and people move through the infrastructure, whether that's roads or phone lines or internet. And in society, we achieve our goals and we transmit our values and beliefs and ideas through our relationships, through that social structure. And so in every one of these cases, the structure has actually governed the behavior of the system. And this is what's true of all, all, li all living systems, that structure not only tells us about the function, structure actually determines the function. And while we certainly need to continue looking for details, details do matter and they'll help us out in, in modeling these, what I hope I've convinced you is that even just using structure, there's a lot that we can learn from the little that we already know. Thank you.